Are we? Okay, members, uh, we will now move to questions to the Minister for fin or Minister of Finance. I call John Stewart to ask the first question. Mr. Stewart. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. The Executive has accepted in principle the recommendations of the RHI inquiry report and, in line with the NDNA commitment, established a subcommittee to consider the recommendations of the RHI report in full and to oversee their implementation. This subcommittee met for the first time in July. The uh, subcommittee heard that significant work has already been done in response to the evidence to the inquiry, including new code of conduct for ministers and special advisers. The Executive Subcommittee is due to meet again in October and will bring a full report on the actions taken and proposed for each recommendation to the Assembly before the Christmas recess. Mr Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, in the spirit of openness and transparency identified within the RHI report, for which he is the lead minister, will he publish in full all unclassified emails which refer to the known order of PPE made by his department with the Irish Government, in particular, in particular as these may have relevance in the forthcoming Northern Ireland Audit Office report? I have no difficulty in, in supplying the, the committee with information that it has asked for, and, and we did supply the committee that, with information that it asked for. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm happy to comply with any of the guidance and regulations in the Ministerial Code of Conduct uh, or the Code for Special Advisors. Here, Mr. Cahill Boylan for your case. To call Cahill Boylan for a question. Mr. Morgan, I just could ask the Minister, just in relation to that, um, could he give us any further updates on relation to the RHI uh, Executive Subcommittee? Or Mr. Morgan. Well, as I said in my answer, the, uh, the subcommittee did meet in July. Uh, it's an executive subcommittee. It's made up of uh, a number of executive ministers. Uh, work had already uh, been undertaken in advance, even of the conclusion of the inquiry, reviewing uh, risk management across departments uh, by group internal audit and fraud investigation services, revised guidance and project management, initiation of project delivery profession within the NICS, uh, NICS People Strategy Review of Business Case and Expenditure Approvals, Initiation of Reviews in, uh, in Record Management Policy uh, and the Electronic Record Management System, Review of Whistleblowing, uh, Institute of More Senior Grading for Private Secretaries, New Practice Guidance for Private Office. All of that work uh, began and, and in advance of the subcommittee sit sitting. So we will, uh, and, and obviously the work was done in relation to the Ministerial Code and the Special Advisors Code, which is published and adopted by the Executive. Uh, and of course, we will uh, analyse that work and the work that is yet to be completed as per the NDNA commitments and the inquiry uh, recommendations, which the Executive have agreed to accept in full and to implement. Uh, and as I said, the intention is to sit again in October and to bring a report uh, by before the Christmas recess. Yeah, sir. Matthew Toole for Hanya Kesh. I call Matthew Toole for a question. Thank you, Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, given what the Minister has just said, and given in the next few days we are going to see the appointment of a new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, what conversations will he and the First Ministers be having with that new appointee about implementing urgently the findings of the RHI inquiry? Because, Minister, you will agree with me that the public in Northern Ireland have yet to be convinced that we are seeing real structural reform in our civil service following the scandal of RHI and other things. Well, the, if, if a person is indeed appointed in the next couple of days, that person, from what I've seen of the shortlist, will be a, a permanent secretary, so they'll be very much cognizant of the, not only the outworkings of the RHI inquiry, but the executive's clear view in uh, uh, accepting the recommendations of the inquiry and undertaking to implement those and the work that has been done to date in terms of various codes. Of course, there's a wider piece of work that he references in terms of reform of the civil service, and that's something that will fall to my own department. It's work that we have already started. Uh, we have begun the discussions with senior civil servants in relation to it, uh, and I intend to bring that work forward uh, to complement uh, the, the findings and the outworkings of the RHI inquiry. I call John Blair for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask, going from the RHI report, if there is in existence a list of targeted recommendations? with actions that have deadlines and that those actions have owners that can be identified for progressing those actions? Yes, I think it's, it's, it's not, bear in mind the RHI report and the outworkings of the inquiry about restoring confidence 
that about ensuring things which were done, which caused the RHI scandal, aren't done in the way they were before, to ensure that there's a different way of approaching things. And there are a huge amount of lessons uh, within that. So it is important for public confidence that it is seen that the recommendations from that are implemented, and they are implemented in a timely fashion uh, and with time and, and urgent action attached to them. We have already undertaken and implemented some of the recommendations. Some of the work began before the inquiry had even reported. I'm not sure if he was on the working group uh, prior to the executive being reformed, which was already five parties looking at, at some of these issues and making recommendations. So a significant amount of work has already taken place, but we want to ensure that uh, confidence is restored in the working of this institution. Uh, the experience of the RHI tobacco uh, deeply dented confidence in, in that working, and, and so the recommendations and the, the actions flowing from that inquiry and from the work that the RHI subcommittee is doing need to be done and seem to be done in a way uh, which restores public confidence. Call Mr. Jim Allister for a question. Question two. With your permission, last concord, I want to group uh, questions two and six. Uh, the Executive has received $2.2 billion of funding from Treasury as part of its COVID-19 response. Mr Allister, for supplementary. Uh, in addition to that, of course, Minister, there would have been the extensive support for the furlough scheme. The Economy Minister told the House this morning that up to a quarter of a million people benefited from that. So when we add in that direct aid, is it a reasonable assumption to conclude that there must have been aid of the order of about £5 billion to Northern Ireland since the onset of COVID, of extra funding? And is it the case that £800 million or thereabouts remains unspent at the centre? Well, it, I, I can't uh, attribute the, the level of funding that he does to the uh, Employee retention scheme, uh, and of course we have the scheme for self-employed as well. I think it was about 78,000 people uh, benefited from that, but we don't have the exact figures for that. So I know he's extrapolating in terms of we had the figures that we were allocated uh, for uh, for this executive to dispose of was 2.2 billion, uh, and he's correct. There is, in, perhaps not in, in total that, but there is in the region of that 600 million of that is with the health department. Uh, and was allocated uh, as part of its COVID response. Uh, and we are working with the health department to ascertain whether they will spend that's to be spent within this financial year. Uh, and obviously the health department are quite rightly preparing for the uh, distinct possibility of a second surge in terms of COVID and what will be required to, to meet and manage that. Uh, and they have other challenges then as a consequence of the COVID experience and other health uh, services uh, that they provide. Uh, and so we're working closely to examine with them uh, whether they will need all of that, whether they will be able to spend all of that, and if so, can it be surrendered and spent on other priorities for the executive? And I, it's my intention then to bring uh, a paper to the executive uh, on uh, Thursday, which will allocate the bulk of the remaining money that he has identified uh, this Thursday, although there will be some held, because uh, as he will know, there are some sectors that as yet there has not been an agreement as to how we would support them. Uh, and there has been some movement on that, I understand, between First Deputy First Minister, the Economy Minister and the Infrastructure Minister. So rather than allocate, uh, we've decided to hold back a certain amount of money uh, to be able to deal with some of those sectors who have missed out thus far. Uh, but the bulk of the money uh, was, resides with health at the moment. And once we find uh, whether they will be able to spend all of that, then we, we will know whether that is, is catered for or whether there will be more return to the centre for further distribution. Call Mr William Humphrey. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. It has already been said that the Northern Ireland Audit Office announced on the 2nd of September that two, £2 billion extra had come from Her Majesty's uh, Treasury, another benefit of being part of the Union. Can I ask the Finance Minister, has he had further conversations with the Her Majesty's Treasury in terms of the furlough scheme being extended in Northern Ireland as it comes close to its end, and has he the support of the Finance Ministers in both Scotland and Wales for that? Uh, the, yes, I have had discussions with Treasury in relation to the furlough scheme. I, I think I have made no uh, secret of this publicly that I think it is premature to end the furlough scheme in October. Uh, when it was originally envisaged back in March, April, whenever it came in April, uh, I think it was, uh, clearly people would have hoped to be well beyond the COVID experience uh, by the end of October. But 
uh, quite clearly from the experience both here and in Britain uh, in the last number of weeks. Uh, COVID is going to be with us for some time and may well, we may well uh, experience a resurgence. Uh, and, and then I think we have had figures shared with us today to say that the, the number of people on the unemployment register has doubled uh, in the last while. And, and I, I noticed that a lot of that has been attributed to young people who are becoming unemployed. So clearly, to abruptly end the furlough scheme at the end of October, I think, is premature. And I've made that representation to Treasury on a number of occasions. I wrote on behalf of the executive a, a week or so ago, uh, just to reinforce that view on behalf of the whole executive, uh, to argue for an extension of the furlough scheme. And I have spoken on a number of occasions and we'll be speaking again actually in the morning with the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers and we collectively uh, will make that point to Treasury as well. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I wonder if uh, the Minister could oblige me by providing, if not today in writing, a per capita breakdown of COVID uh, support for the people of Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic. Uh, and should the data evidence that the people of Northern Ireland are receiving above average support, would he concede that there are benefits for Northern Ireland being part of the United Kingdom. If the member's idea of selling the union is that we are dependent and will always be dependent on handouts, then I'm not sure that that, uh, and particularly on a government which members on the opposite benches have accused of betrayal on a number of occasions, then to put your eggs in that basket in terms of your advancing the argument for the union, I think is rather a weak one. Uh, of course, we are taxpayers. Uh, and we've received a share back as the, the government uh, in Britain has distributed uh, COVID response money. I can get him the breakdown that, that he wishes, uh, but I have to say if I was a neutral, which I'm clearly not in this argument, the idea that, uh, that we'll get handouts and we're dependent and we will always continue to be dependent is not one which will sell the union to be. Declan McAleer for your cash. I call Declan McAleer for a question. Uh, Graham Agra, thank the Minister for his answer. Given the fact that we're uh, just over 100 days away from uh, ex exiting, uh, could, uh, with, with the company and loss of EU funding for real development programmes, could the Minister give, give us any update or, uh, he would have from the, um, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the possibility of getting this uh, transport for here? Well, I think one of the associated frustrations with how Brexit has been handled in London is that we have a no clarity as yet in relation to Shared Prosperity Fund, and that, that view uh, is shared by uh, colleagues that I speak to in both the Scottish and the Welsh administrations as well. Uh, and we had expected some degree of certainty. The executive have a very clear view that the commitment to uh, replacing like with like in terms of lost EU funding, that the executive wants to be in charge of designing the programmes and distributing uh, the money for that is, is one which is shared right across the executive. So we continue to press that case uh, in relation to uh, Whitehall, uh, but as yet we have had very little clarity in relation to how much and how that fund might be operated. Question number three has been withdrawn. Initiate him, Sir Philip McGuigan, for any question. I now call Philip McGuigan for a question. Graham Elgut, Kest Evercahar, question number When setting public sector pay policy for 2021 at the beginning of this month, I have required all public bodies to actively consider how pay awards can be targeted to ensure the payment of the Living Wage Foundation's living wage. My officials will shortly begin to engage with each of the departments to examine the practical implications for the public sector in taking this forward. Supplementary question for Philip McGuigan. Gramelgut, uh, last can call your Irish. August uh, Gramelgut, Minister, uh, and further to your response, Minister, would you agree with me that, uh, with regard to wages, terms, and conditions for workers, that the executive should be an exemplar uh, of good practice and a model for other employees, employers to follow? Yes, I think we should. Uh, I think if this is uh, a policy that we, uh, and it's part of a, an NDA commitment, uh, which all of the executive party signed up to in terms of the living wage, then of course it's one which the executive has an obligation to set a standard. The, the vast majority of civil servants are paid above uh, the living wage, uh, but nonetheless there are other public bodies uh, which I think we can encourage uh, along that uh, regard as well. And uh, as I say, in terms of setting the pay policy, I give the flexibility for uh, different departments and public bodies to meet this and an encouragement uh, to meet, as I say, the, the Living Wage Foundation's living wage, which is above what might be considered the national living wage. Next year, I'm Sir Pat Catney for your case. I call Pat Catney for a question. Thank you very much. Well, Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Does the Minister agree with me on the furlough scheme 
uh, comes to an end. Workers in certain sectors will be hit harder than others. And will the outline of any further targeted wage support schemes to help workers in these struggling sectors are planned? Thank you. Well, I, as, as I said in answer to Mr. Humphrey, said uh, the, the, the continuation of that uh, employee retention scheme, which is commonly known as the furlough scheme, uh, is one that I have raised with Treasury on many occasions and, and, and argue that it's premature. Uh, to bring it to an end in October. And of course, there are, are sectors in particular, and we, we have argued that if they are not to continue it in full, that they certainly should look at specific sectors which are going to continue to struggle uh, in, in the conditions that, even with uh, a, 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 a partial reopening of the economy or an attempt to reopen it as fully as can be, there are sectors that are going to continue to struggle. And we have seen the unemployment registers uh, dramatically increase, so that is evidence already before the end of October comes of the impact that there's going to be out there. So, of course, I agree with them that we need to continue to target that, and we will continue to raise that uh, with Treasury. Uh, my intention is to try uh, and have uh, more direct engagement, perhaps over in Treasury, before the end of the month, if that can be arranged. Uh, and I'll continue to engage with my Scottish and Welsh counterparts, in, indeed, in the morning. I'm speaking to them, uh, and we continue to sink off the same hymn sheet in relation to the, the need for a continuation of that scheme. I call Dr. Steve Aiken for a question. When officials began examining the options for establishing a fiscal council earlier this year, but work did not progress as intended, given the need to focus on the immediate COVID-19 response. However, my department is now actively refocusing on the issue, and consideration has been given to what the Council's terms of reference might be and how members could be appointed. I will be able to provide further update on this once this work has been sufficiently advanced. Dr. Aiken for a supplementary. And may I thank the Minister for his uh, reply so far. Uh, could I ask the Minister, bearing in mind it is eight months since uh, New Decade, New Approach, and the fact that we are having significant issues getting details of budgets, what is happening with money supplies, what is happening within internal departments as well, and the fact that there is not an economic plan as yet to get us out of COVID that we have anybody, members of the Assembly, have seen sight of. Can you expedite the formation of the Fiscal Council so that we are able to not only hand in glove or bring an economic plan to get us out of COVID, we are also in a position where we can look at it and monitor it carefully to make sure it is, in fact, affordable and deliverable? Well, I, I agree that we have all lost time as a consequence of COVID, and I am sure if he has questions to all ministers from all departments, uh, work that we had all envisaged doing, particularly work which was related to NDNA commitments, which the Fiscal Council is one, uh, has suffered in terms of time lag because people have just been so busy uh, trying to respond in the first instance to the COVID challenge. Uh, and of course, we, we are picking that up and we will pick it up at pace. It is important, though, to get it right. It is important to get the, the right powers in terms of reference for a fiscal council and to get the right people into it. So, uh, in, in, in one regard, where we, we, we do not wish to delay any further and get this done, and it is a commitment which I intend to fulfil, we need to make sure that, that it is done correctly. Of course, in terms of the difficulties, we have been in a cycle of annual budgets. We are now in a cycle that has been interrupted by COVID, interrupted by COVID response and trying to deal with the additional money we have across, trying to spend that quickly, trying to get it out there and make sure it is properly audited and uh, accounted for. Uh, but following the spending review, which has begun now in Whitehall, uh, I hope to be in the, in the autumn then in a position where we can announce multi-annual budgets and then we have much more clarity. Uh, advanced sight of how departments will spend money and allow uh, committees like the Finance Committee and others to, uh, to provide the appropriate level of scrutiny to departments. Called Kelly Armstrong. Very much, Deputy Speaker. If I'm delighted to hear the Minister saying that, that we are working towards multi year budgets, does the Minister believe that a fiscal council needs to be up and running prior to the introduction of a multi year budget? Well, I don't think the two uh, events are necessarily linked. Uh, we intend to uh, as I say, the, we are told that the, there will be an autumn statement or an autumn budget event uh, in London. That could be as late as of November, uh, because sometimes these budget state, autumn statements have run into December even. So we're not in control of that timetable, to be quite honest. But uh, I think it, uh, our intention is to get the Fiscal Council with the right people and the right terms of reference appointed uh, up and working properly. Uh, and there is a, a linkage in terms of the British government in doing that, because they have a role in, in involved in that. So that process is not entirely of our own uh, our doing. Uh, and as I say, trying to time it in terms of what may emerge from Whitehall in the autumn is something we don't have no control over. So 
I think if we get the right council in place and give it the right remit, then hopefully the two things will coincide, uh, and they, they should be in roughly the same time frame. But as I say, we can't exactly say when either of them will happen. Madam Chair, Gemma Dolan, for your cash to call Gemma Dolan for a comment. Gourmet Yogurt, and I thank the Minister for his, question, his answer so far. Um, could I ask the Minister for an update on uh, Fiscal Powers Commission? Well, similarly, uh, it's another piece of work that I had undertaken to do uh, when we came into office in, in January. Uh, another piece of work, unfortunately, given the, the emergency that we were faced with in terms of the COVID pandemic, uh, as with a lot of other departments that work we had intended to do has slipped uh, in the time frame. But uh, similarly, we, what we are back uh, looking very actively again at the Fiscal Commission, uh, at, at agreeing in terms of reference, looking at who might be on that, how they may be appointed, uh, and making sure that our, the uh, uh, Fiscal Commission uh, can look at the idea, as they have done already in both Wales and in Scotland, of what other uh, tax levers and uh, financial uh, levers that the executive might uh, request be transferred over here so we can have much more control uh, over our own uh, spending power. I can see you, Mr. Matthew Toole for your cash. I call Matthew Toole for Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Further, further, further to that point, two quick questions. Can you confirm both the Fiscal Council and the Fiscal Powers Commission will have real economic forecasting powers because simply bean counting would be enough to solve the structural challenges that face this place? Number two, what conversations has he had uh, with his counterparts in Scotland and Wales and elsewhere, including inside the Executive, about the appalling powers being taken in the Internal Market Bill to undermine the core tenets of devolution, not just in this part of the world, but across the UK. What is he doing to stand up with other finance ministers for what the UK government is doing to breach the fundamental basis of devolution across these islands? Well, can I say in relation to the remit of both uh, the Fiscal Commission and the Fiscal Council, uh, that, that is yet to be decided. But yes, we want to make sure that both uh, can do the jobs that we, uh, we expect of them. Uh, and in relation to the other matter of the, the legislation currently going through Westminster, of course he will know that the executive is divided on that. Uh, we have very different views uh, in the executive in relation uh, to Brexit in its entirety, but in particular to that bill. Uh, and I do share the concerns that he has expressed. It is on the agenda for my discussion tomorrow morning with the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers, and I, I know uh, in advance that they share the same concerns that we have in relation uh, to that, uh, the implications for devolution and, and, and uh, that, that, that they uh, share those concerns that we have as well. So there will be an opportunity, I think, tomorrow for both ourselves, Wales and Scotland, to agree a position uh, and, and, and make that position uh, together to the British Government. Uh, question number six has already been grouped with number two. I guess I nice hear him, Sir Melissa McHugh, for your cash. I call Melissa McHugh for a question. The executive agreed that a review of arms length bodies is, is again another uh, commitment in the new decade, new approach uh, agreement. Uh, it, it committed us to carry out a uh, review with a view to their rationalisation, also their efficiency and effectiveness. The number of arm's length bodies being considered is 116 in total cost of, uh, total cost of approximately £11 billion, pounds, an estimated staff and complement of 135,000. So we have uh, initiated a two-stage review, uh, and the first is gathering information from departments, uh, background information, the, the, the bodies themselves, the budget, the staff and the functions internal and external board members and remuneration, uh, frequency of meetings, etc., details of what the ALB has achieved uh, when it was subjected to review and the conclusion of that review, where the ALB is located. The second stage will involve looking at the rationale for the arm's length bodies, uh, considering whether the functions that carries out can be delivered in the department itself. Do they require political impartiality? Uh, is it a technical function which would be inappropriate to be carried out by a government department? Is there overlaps with other ALBs? Has it outlived its purpose? Should it be abolished? Does it have sufficient transparency to the public about its activities and could this be improved? Now, that work is progressing well and it is my intention that it will be brought to the Executive uh, for consideration in the near future and that will include proposals for the rationalisation, efficiency and effectiveness of arm's length bodies considered in the review. Minister, would you agree with me to this uh, actually uh, will provide an opportunity for both good governance, increased accountability and democracy, uh, and improved service delivery that will reduce uh, unnecessary bureaucracy uh, in relation to arms length, arms length bodies. 
Well, I think that the, uh, I agree with the member that the, the purpose of this review was an around a uh, uh, efficiency and effectiveness, and the review has already identified emerging themes around the area of governance, including regulation of boards, relationships with sponsorship officials, accountability to ministers, and regular reviews. And we're considering all of these issues. The outcome of this should be better public services uh, delivered in a more efficient, and a more effective, and a more transparent way. That's the overarching principle, uh, and we, we want to see that achieved. So, as I say, that work is ongoing. It is progressing very well, and it's my intention to bring a report to the executive in the not too distant future. I call Mr. Paul Free. Mr. Speaker, can, uh, given the fact that we, I think, we all support the review of armed lance bodies, can the minister assure this house that he will review his own department with regards to governance and transparency, and indeed the department's information management policy, so that his department is completely transparent and accountable, and so that the scrutiny committees do not have to threaten court action in order to get information? Well, can I say the. the uh Retention of information policy is a civil service wide policy. It's not the department's policy. It's one which was adopted by the civil service some time back, uh, possibly when even one of your colleagues might have been Minister for Finance at the time. Uh, and that's the policy that pertains today. Uh, and I, it's my view that the department is transparent and accountable and, of course, responsive to the committee. And it has always been my uh, position within the department that committees are entitled uh, to information they request and that that should be provided in an efficient and effective manner. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the Minister if, if he would consider reviewing or extending the review to local government and whether additional functions could possibly have been um, added to them or transferred to them. I, uh, well, I, I'm afraid it's not within the remit of this particular investigation. We wouldn't consider local government an arm's length body because they have their own uh, degree of autonomy. They're responsible. Uh, in terms of management uh, of broadly of local government and departments and communities. Uh, but I, I do think she makes a fair point. The, the, the local government big change has now been in place for some time, and I think it is uh, perhaps an appropriate time for an executive to look at the powers that have been transferred to local government, what has worked, what perhaps hasn't. And uh, I'm always uh, open to the idea of transferring further powers to local government, I think. Uh, particularly, I, I think they had an opportunity uh, in relation to the response to the pandemic to step up the plate, and they have done so uh, very, very well. And uh, I think increased cooperation and collaboration between government here and local government is, is a very good thing. As I say, ultimately, we are about providing better services to the public, uh, and we're both in the same place in that regard. So I think it, it could be timely. I, I would certainly be supportive of an idea of reviewing the powers of local government, uh, but it's not part of this arms length body review. We move now to question number eight. Mr Robinson, we have time for a quick question and quick answer. Okay. Quest, question eight. The Executive is rightly considering the impact of COVID-19 as it made allocations firstly in response to the pandemic and then to aid our economic recovery. Alongside that, the Executive has considered all the other pressures faced by departments in the context of the resources available and allocations were made in the June monitoring round. In that round, the departments were given extra flexibility to reallocate budgets, and that will again be the case in the October monitoring round. The additional flexibility will assist ministers to respond dynamically to the impact of COVID-19 in their respective departments. Can I, can I ask the minister, because of the serious financial impact COVID-19 could have on our finances, is there a possibility that we will have to lobby Treasury for additional block grant funding? finances before the end of the financial year? Well, I think in the first case, uh, we, we want to have an assessment of what departments have spent, as, as, as in one of the earlier questions, we were, we were discussing the, uh, the COVID allocation money that we, we had in terms of response to that, and, and we have spent a, a very significant amount of that. There will be more allocations this Thursday, and there is money in health, uh, uh, hopefully sufficient to meet the challenges that they need, and perhaps even more. Uh, so we need to look at that. We need to look at where department budgets are sitting, because departments will not have been doing the business that they were intended to do in the first half of this financial year. Uh, we, we had some returns in June monitoring. We are currently in the exercise of October monitoring, uh, and we should be bringing the position in, in, in the next number of weeks uh, to the executive in relation to that and to the assembly. Uh, and we will see how departments are spending the money they have. Some of them will have additional challenges because of COVID, but others will have money that they otherwise would have spent that they won't be able to spend because of the pandemic and the way things have closed down. So I think in the first instance we need to look at our own resources and see what we have Minister. before we decide for further okay. interventions. 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. We have one withdrawn, that's number eight. Um, but I now call Mr William Humphrey for a question. Minister, in terms of the, the, the review he talked about for arms length bodies, in terms of efficiencies, in terms of effectiveness, governance and transparency, uh, can he advise this House as to when that piece of work will be completed? Because in conversations and discussions we've had with the Northern Ireland Office of at the Public Accounts Committee. This is an issue which, across government, has huge implications in terms of finance, in terms of budgets, money that can be used, perhaps, in, in, in many departments, much more efficiently and effectively. Well, as, I, as I said in the answer to that question, I, I think it was something like 116 bodies, £11 billion worth of budget, and 135,000 uh, staff attached to them. Uh, and the question he right, quite rightly asks is, can some of that work be carried out within departments? Uh, arms length bodies, uh, there is no uh, formula for the creation. If you actually look into them, you find uh, completely different uh, times that were set up. Uh, most of them, I, I, would, I would imagine, come from the direct rule era, when and there was an attempt to create some veneer of local democracy or local democratic input into decision-making. Uh, the question is, post uh, Good Friday Agreement and devolution, uh, is that still appropriate at this time? Uh, and of course, uh, we, we need to look at all of that, the efficiencies, the effectiveness, the transparency. And we have had conversations uh, and continue conversations with the Controller and Auditor General. Uh, I had a conversation when we were starting the Secretary to outline uh, our view on this and to take his, his feelings in relation to some of these, because, uh, I, I, like himself, I was a member of the Public Accounts Committee many times, and I know the, the questions that have come through it. So uh, I, I think we're very cognizant of their view in relation to that, of what the outcome needs to be. Uh, and I think it, it's well beyond time we had a really long hard look at some of the arms and bodies and, and what they are required for in the future. Supplementary, Mr Humphrey. Thank you very much. Can I ask the Minister, and thank him for his answer, in relation to the efficiency and effectiveness and cost effectiveness in terms of north-south bodies, will it include, be included in this piece of work? Well, I would argue that the north-south bodies probably have not been able to get, uh, for various reasons, to their full uh, remit. Uh, and, and, and some of us indeed have a view that perhaps uh, better and more efficient and more effective north south bodies should have been created back in 1998, 1999, uh, but that's another argument. Uh, but clearly they are a joint agreement between this administration and the administration in Dublin, so they're not singularly a, a matter for review uh, by this administration in itself. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, and can, can I ask the Minister to provide an update on considerations within his department or any work that might be ongoing with the Department for Communities in relation to the financial, uh, potential financial plight of local councils due to income deficits caused by the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Well, uh, I have to say we have a very good working relationship with communities, as we do with all departments. Uh, finance has that role in that we, we work closely with every department. Uh, and we, we have had uh, many engagements with the Minister and the Department for Communities. I think we, we have a, another meeting scheduled for Thursday morning. Uh, and we have already given, I think it was 20 million additional uh, uh, money to councils this year uh, already in terms of their COVID response. And I am on record as, in response to previous previous answer acknowledging the role that councils have played, how they have stepped up in relation to assisting uh, the public response uh, in, in relation to the pandemic and the public service response. Uh, I will be making an allocation on Thursday uh, from some of the remaining COVID, uh, uh, COVID money. Uh, there has been a bid in relation to councils and I hope to be making a proposition to the executive in relation to that. Mr Blair, supplementary. Deputy Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for that. Can I ask further to that if he can detail any scope or scoping or investigation uh, which is being done on behalf of his department with the Council representative bodies to, to uh, assess the level of help needed uh, as we move towards another financial year as well? I, I had uh, the opportunity, I think, on Friday to address uh, a, a NILGA delegation uh, and to take questions from a range of councils right across all of the 11 councils uh, and have that engagement. I think that's hugely important. I think the closer the working relationship between central government here and the local government, I, I think the, the better public services we will collectively provide. I know my own department uh, through LPS and others are working with the council in terms of rates uh, and that engagement is going on in terms of the council spend and, and projecting the council spend o over the financial year. So I think, yes, absolutely, I want officials to continue to work. Of course, communities have a role there as well. Continue to work with councils to assess their needs and make 
make sure that there is, and bearing in mind the limited pot that we have to go around all departments, but that they are supported as best we possibly can. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. What happened to the 33 million of COVID support money for the arts? Well, if there, as, as the member will know, uh, money which comes across as a Barnet consequential is unhypothecated. Therefore, it's not, it's not ring fenced for any particular area. The, uh, in and around that time that money came across, we did make a £4 million allocation for some resilience money to the arts. I am making a proposition to the executive on Thursday, in which, as with the, the, the bid for local councils, local government, there has been a bid from the Department of Communities in to support the arts. I see it very much as economic uh, support as well, because arts venues are very much part of our tourism product and our economic product here as well. So I am very sympathetic uh, to the arguments that were made, and I intend to bring a proposition to the executive on Thursday in relation to that. Mr. Nesbitt, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister. On the 31st of March, the Minister informed this House that his strategy for coping with the COVID crisis uh, was, and I quote, uh, we can be flexible and agile in our response. And further, we have allowed people to be agile. That is what the public would expect of us, to be as agile as we can, to be on our toes. What is agile about sitting on £33 million for two and a half months when the arts sector it's supposed to protect is crumbling. Well, what we have been endeavouring to do over the summer months is to get an agreed economic recovery strategy from the executive. And I have said that I want to allocate uh, the, the money, the remaining money, because we, uh, we have a limited remaining pot of COVID money. The Treasury have made it very clear that's it as far as this financial year is concerned. Uh, of course, we have the money sitting with health, but in terms of what's at our disposal, uh, that that's it. And I wanted to make sure that it was allocated against economic reco recovery proposals that the executive had endorsed. We hadn't got those over the course of the summer. We now have those, and I'm in a position to make uh, an allocation this week, and I will bring the proposal to the executive on Thursday. Call Mr. Thomas Buchanan for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what progress has been made in seeking to secure funding? for the victims-related pension scheme? Well, as the, as the member will know, the, uh, the scheme, uh, according to the own statement of funding policy from Whitehall, uh, the, 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 the party that proposes the policy, that legislates for it, carries the cost of implementation of that policy. That's the executive's position, uh, and the people who have done that are the British Government and the NIO. Uh, now, what they have legislated for and the policy they have put forward is not what was agreed at Stormont House. It's different from what was agreed at Stormont House. Therefore, they own it. And it's my clear view, acting on behalf of the Executive, and it's a clear argument that I've been making to Treasury and to the NIO on behalf of the Executive, that they are responsible for paying whatever, and we have, as yet have no clear figures as to what this would cost, that the Northern Ireland Office and the British Government are responsible for paying out in relation to this scheme. Mr Buchanan, for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Will the Minister accept that it was totally absurd of his party to seek to block this scheme, resulting in a court case, and will he give this House a commitment this afternoon that he will now do all that he can in his position in order to seek to secure the funding for the scheme so that there's no further delays? Well, I can assure the member that that's what I've been trying to do, is to seek the secure fund. We don't know what the fund is going to be. We don't know what the cost is. The, uh, Minister for Justice put out an estimate, I think, that uh, perhaps up to £800 million. That's completely different from the estimate that the Northern Ireland Office gave us uh, a number of months back. Uh, and so we don't have, and I have been attempting to secure the commitment from the British Government to live up to their own statement of funding policy, which is part of their own rulebook, that they created the policy and legislated for it, therefore they own the cost of it. And that's what I intend to do. The idea that the NIO were trying to steamroll us into uh, to accepting responsibility for it, uh, of course, a department here has to be designated uh, to carry it forward. But the real argument in relation to who pays uh, for the scheme itself is still to be accepted by the British Government, and that's what I intend to pursue, and that's the, what the Executive have asked me to pursue. Uh, Sir Declan McAleer for your cash. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, has the Minister any plans to make changing places mandatory in building regulations? Uh, I'm committed to incorporating the change in places toilets uh, into local building regulations as soon as possible. Uh, during the summer, I had the opportunity to meet with Christine McClements, who's campaigned tirelessly 
for changes to built-in regulations in respect of changing places toilets. And following my meeting with Christine, I invited her to be part of the technical working group, and I'm delighted that she accepted that invitation. The Department is now working through the necessary changes to make changing places toilets a requirement in new buildings that meet the spe- specified criteria. Working with the Building Regulation or Advisory Committee, the Department is developing proposals for the mandatory provision of changing places toilets. And Tuasal McAleer for Hunya Cash Torlinta, I call Declan McAleer for a supplementary. I am going to thank the Minister for his response. Um, given your uh, responsibility for this estate, uh, will you provide uh, changing place of facilities in the, on the Stormont estate, on the grounds in the state, Stormont estate? Well, I am pleased to say that work is also progressing to install a changing places toilet uh, near to the Momolan Play Park, which is a fantastic facility on this estate. Uh, and I believe that the promotion of changing place toilets represents an important step in dignity and equality for all. And, and uh, I mean, I have had the opportunity to speak to Christine and to other campaigners. Uh, I'm very aware, and there are members in the chamber here who have been campaigning on this issue as well. Uh, and in particularly in relation to play parks, I mean, you see the wonderful facility it is there, but the fact that some children cannot access or cannot access proper toilet facilities while they're accessing uh, that facility is clearly uh, an equality issue. And so I'm very pleased that we will bring that forward in built regulations and we will take our own initiative in the, 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 the state that we have authority over and, and doing that right away. Old Kelly Armstrong for a question. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, one of the outcomes of the COVID pandemic, pandemic sorry, has been the issues that face-to-face coverings and lack of face-to-face meetings have had on people like myself with hearing disabilities. Um, I would like to ask you if your enterprise shared services section could work or are working on delivering video relay service or to um, come up with a, a bulk way of buying clear mask for customer facing services across the civil service? Uh, I, I actually share the member's uh, difficulty because I have an hearing, uh, a hearing uh, difficulty myself uh, and I, I also find it uh, difficult now with the, uh, the wearing of face coverings to, to engage and, and uh, I, I also find uh, Zoom meetings difficult at times as well uh, in terms of trying to hear what people are saying. So it is, it is a real challenge uh, for those who have a hearing impairment. Uh, I, I'm not certain as to what work has been carried out, but I'm very happy to take her question back to the department and provide her with a written answer to it. Supplementary. Actually, I'd like to just use my supplementary to thank the Minister to get to uh, question six and topicals. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I guess in Kate Cash, the earliest in for when you Cahill Boylan. Cahill Boylan. Uh, Cahill Boylan uh, uh, the Minister, of course, is aware that nine months on, money deducted from the health workers' pay um, due to their justifiable strike action has not yet been reimbursed. Can the Minister provide some clarity on when this will happen, please? Well, the executive agreed back as far as I think May to provide uh, £1.6 million uh, to reimburse uh, health workers who were, were, had been uh, striking uh, as they went back into face uh, the front line of, of, of taking on the COVID pandemic. Uh, I made that money available to the department. Uh, of course, then it is a matter for the, the health minister to uh, allocate that money. Very quick supplementary. Thank the Minister for that. And it's incredible, Minister, that these health workers are working at the front line through COVID. And the Minister is now, the Health Minister, is saying that this matter lies within the Executive. Um, can you just clarify where the actual uh, matter lies? Does it lie with yourself or lie with the Health Minister? Well, the, the, the Health Minister has asked further questions of the Executive uh, in relation to what he sees as a, a, a repercussive. Uh, uh, element this. I, I'm of a very clear view, and I think the executive, when they endorsed the proposition to make the funding available, uh, viewed the, the health workers, and particularly in relation to those heading into face the COVID pandemic, as a unique set of circumstances and one which was worthy of our support and one which doesn't apply to any other uh, circumstance in terms of employment in the public sector. Uh, so, uh, of course, the health minister will want to satisfy himself of any questions that he has in this regard. But where, where I'm very clear as finance minister, and I think the executive is very clear in relation to the paying of these people. And members, that concludes our business. The time is now up. So if uh, you would just take your ease while we prepare for the next session, please.